order remains very difficult. Okay, I've got to click this here. Now, there we go. While the situation in Ukraine's border remains serious, we would like to just take a moment to talk about the past, the present, and the future of Ukraine. And if you could tell us, Ambassador, just a little bit of the history of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people and the relationship with neighboring Russia as a backdrop for our discussion this evening. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much for spending this evening with us and thank you for organizing the, to the Indiana Council on World Affairs, but all other colleagues to be able to spend this evening with you. And thank you for everyone who decided instead of having a nice family dinner or right <laughs> after family dinner to be with us and discuss what is really important, not only for my country, but also important for the world. Mm -hmm. Because again, I, I know Ukraine is now on all uh, TV channels and the focus is on Ukraine right now. But I would like to share a little bit more why it is important, not only for the United States, but for all people who cherish democracy, who believe democracy is how we people should live and how we should uh, develop our planet together, even as global as that. This fight that we have right now for our independence, but also for our democracy is, is, at, you know, is, is central for many countries that value and cherish, again, democracy and independence. So Ukraine has gained or regained its independence in 1991, when uh, the majority of people, 98% of Ukrainians, regardless of whether they live, whether it's West or East or South or West or Crimea, all of them, all of us, voted, I was too young uh, in 1991 to vote, but I remember going with my parents to the voting to the polling station, all of Ukrainians vote to be independent. And uh, even though last year we marked 30 years of our independence, as a country, we have thousands of years of history. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the last about 400 years, we didn't have the statehood. So we were always occupied either by Russian empire or by the Soviet Union, that's why, you know, it's a very difficult legacy. And during these times of occupation, especially in the 20th century, Ukraine went through a number of very, very difficult uh, tragedies, like Holodomor, when millions, uh, tens, or, you know, there are different estimates, but millions of Ukrainians have been killed by, uh, by the orchestrated uh, mm -hmm. hunger. Mm -hmm. Like during the World War II, when, you know, 80% of the European theater battles were actually on the territory of Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, Holocaust, you know, today is the day of remembrance of all the victims. And it's our Jewish brothers and sisters who lived with us on the territory of Ukraine right now, but we didn't have the statehood yet. So, you know, tragedy after tragedy after tra tragedy. And one of the reasons for that is that Ukrainians, even though we always have been a large nation by European standards, we didn't have the statehood for a long time. Now, this is in the modern history, the first time that we have our statehood and independence for 30 years. For 30 years now, we have our own institution. Yes, we are only rebuilding some of them from scratch. Essentially, some of them we only started building after the revolution of dignity in 2014. But we have clearly, like in many periods, historical periods before, Ukraine has made a civilizational choice to be free, to be independent, and what is even more important, to be democratic and to be European and to strive to join European Union and NATO in the future. This is even written now in our constitution. And that civilizational choice to be democratic, to be free and independent is the reason why Russia attacked us in 2014. You know, we can read Putin's articles, we can uh, guess what is the real reason for Putin to attack us in 2014, to illegally occupy Crimea, to wage war on us in all kinds of hybrid ways, or to do this escalation that we all are seeing right now since April 2021. But the essence is the free democratic Ukraine is a threat to any authoritarian regime, especially to the one which is very close to us and the one 
which is building their legacy on the history they are trying to steal from us. So we are ancient country and modern at the same time. I think that reflects very well on uh, the way we are. I mean, Ukrainians are very deeply devoted to our uh, roots and to the, uh, you know, we love our Vyshevankas, we love traditional, you know, the embroidery that we wear, we love our uh, Ukrainian traditional food. At the same time, we are the nation of startups and uh, the IT sector and other innovative industries are among the most uh, rapidly growing sectors in Ukraine. But we know that, you know, because of the neighbor that we have, it's going to be for a long time, this fight, constant fight for our independence, for our sovereignty, for being Ukrainians and being able to be, you know, the owners and decision makers in our own house. So the escalation that we see right now is a continuation of, you know, many instances and many conflicts that we had in the past. Uh, just recently in January, uh, on January 22nd, we have celebrated a very important holiday for us, a unification of Ukraine, uh, which happened in 1919, uh, a year after Ukraine proclaimed independence in the 20th century in 1918, which we did actually together with Finland. And together with Finland, we were in the same league of oppressed by Russia people. And we fought for our independence and we both, both countries gained the independence in 1918. Unfortunately, Ukraine was not able to, uh, to remain independent and we were then occupied by, by the Soviet Union. But, you know, again, we learned our lessons. So when we are talking about now, even though the threat is very high, the risks are very high. We have more than 100,000 Russian troops and military equipment around our border. We see increased presence of uh, Russia in Belarus. We see uh, increased militarization of Crimea, Ukrainian Crimea, which they have illegally occupied. Even though we know that we have a very capable, battle-tested, very motivated army, we have more than 100, 400,000 now veterans who are, again, very motivated and capable to defend our country. And we have Ukrainians, the majority of Ukrainians, who still, like in 1991, are very devoted to the country, regardless of, again, where we live, what we like, what parties do we like. Because, again, Ukraine is a democracy. We do have vibrant opposition. But we are all united by our love to Ukraine and our readiness to defend our country. We really hope that diplomatic solution is still possible. Unlike, again, Russia, we don't want a war. We're trying, we're doing everything possible to prevent the, the war. We're doing everything possible to demotivate Russian Federation from furthering this aggression. Again, we are not talking about the new attack because Russia already attacked us in 2014. We are uh, trying to stay calm and we are trying to stay reserved so that again, Russia will not use or misuse any of our actions and pretend that we are provoking even though we have the, uh, all the rights mm. to get the, the Crimea back or to get Donetsk and Lugansk occupied territories back. We do not plan any offensives. We are working day and night, all the diplomats, the president and everyone else in order to make the diplomatic solution still possible trying to dissuade Russia. And we are not alone there. So we are doing it together with all of our friends and allies, United States first and foremost. Uh, we always say that US is the strategic partner number one. I would say strategic friend number one. Uh, and uh, just today our presidents again spoke and it's the second conversation in only in 2022, which just started but uh, it's a continuation of actually a new level of strategic partnership that we started developing from 2021. So we renewed our strategic partnership charter. We uh, renewed our trade and investment commission. We have started working very actively on building Ukraine's defense capabilities. And for the first time, actually, 
Last year, when President Zelensky visited President Biden in the White House, we have signed the agreement between our Ministry of Defense and Pentagon on the strategic defense framework. So all the necessary decisions and roadmaps and agreements are there. We are in the implementation phase. We are on a firm road to successful, prosperous Ukraine, which will deliver as a democracy to Ukrainian people. Unfortunately, that uh, has a very negative response from, again, our neighbor from the East. And that is why we see this aggression and we see this escalation. But we are very hopeful that we can resolve through democratic measures together with all of our friends and allies, this escalation and this recent situation, focus on deoccupation of the territories that have been occupied by Russia in 2014. Most importantly, and it's very important for our president, return our people back because we have 475 people that we know that are illegally detained and held in captivity, either in Crimea or in Russia or on the uncontrolled territories. But that's only those that we know and have the account for. And we are very keen to get all the people back and return to the normal life and focus on all the strategic priorities that we have to develop. Mm -hmm. We know it will take years. I mean, there is still a, long, a large homework that Ukraine has to do. We're at the beginning of our transformation as the country. We just started working on the reform of the judiciary. We just opened the land market in 2021. There is still a lot we have to do and we are willing to do it in order to become more prosperous, in order to uh, increase the productivity, in order to develop our GDP, and in order to make Ukrainians more wealthy. Because ultimately that's the goal of any democracy, to ensure that your people live better. So with that, I would like to finish my short introduction. I'm sorry if it wasn't that short, but I would be more than happy to discuss any of these points more in detail, answer your questions and have a, a discussion. Well, actually I was looking over my questions. I thought you answered several of them. <laughs> uh, one of my questions was gonna be on the Ukrainian military readiness and you have spoke You've spoken quite forcefully that you feel that you have 400,000 people. I, uh, people are ready to defend. Uh, you are believed that the Ukrainian army is strong and ready to defend its um, the integrity of its country and its its um, its its quest to be what it, it wants to be, which is a democratic nation. Uh, Professor Brzezinski, who was the National Security Advisor under Jimmy Carter and served many presidents, um, famously observed, "Without Ukraine." Russia ceases to be an empire, but with Ukraine suborned and then subordinated, Russia automatically becomes an empire. What animates Russia to believe they're entitled to occupy Ukraine and thus return themselves to the edge of the end, to the age of the empires, especially after the breakup of the Soviet Union, which of course Putin doesn't accept? Well, you know, we've heard numerous times from many Russian leaders and Putin is no exception there, that they think that breakup of the former so of the Soviet Union has been the largest mistake yeah. or the largest tragedy. It has been the largest celebration for us. It was a victory for which generations of Ukrainians fought. It's not only people in the 20th century. It's not only people during, you know, before, after we gained the independence in 1918, it's not only people who, you know, throughout uh, last century, century before that, people in the United States, we have a very vibrant diaspora that preserved Ukraine here, that spoke Ukrainian, that went to Ukrainian and built Ukrainian churches in, 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 in the US, that while being exemplary American citizens, mm -hmm. also preserved their cultural heritage and taught their kids and grandkids to, to speak Ukrainian. Uh, I don't know why anyone in the 21st century would think that being an empire or rebuilding an empire or forcefully holding any of the neighbors in the union would actually generate some benefit for for their own people. It's clear to us 
that Ukraine definitely wants to be independent, is better off to be independent. We know what happens to us when we are uh, occupied by, by somebody. But it's also clear to us that for the people of Russia, it would be much better if their leaders would focus on their own people, their own country. And, you know, we are dreaming about the day when we can get the Crimea and the occupied territories of Lugansk and Donetsk back, and we can actually restart our relations with Russia just as a neighbor. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, again, we are not gonna move from, from the place where Ukraine is situated, neither will Russia. So we had difficult story, you know, uh, pages in our joint history with other neighbors as well. You know, we had a couple of hundred years ago, difficult stories with Poland, with Turkey, with other countries, but we've learned how to live together. We found a formula how to for forgive and also ask for forgiveness for anything that we've done to each other in the past. We learned the lessons from the past and we are focusing on the future. I wish we could do the same with, with Russian Federation, but that will require for Russian Federation to withdraw from our territory and stop being aggressive to us. And that will be a new start for our pure neighborly relations. Mm -hmm. We really hope that at some point it will be possible. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, everything we hear from the president and all the papers that are being published and all, all the public narrative right now is denying Ukraine the right to be a sovereign country. It's actually about us not to be a country, which is totally not true, not according to the history, not according to the reality and facts, and most importantly, not in accordance with what Ukrainians feel and want. What is your thought on the disclosure by British intelligence this week that Putin, should he invade and make his way to Kiev, that he wants to install a puppet government in Kiev? Well, we took it into account, of course, and we know that we already had in uh, during the Yanukovych time when President uh, Yanukovych has been elected as the president of Ukraine, we had many positions at that time in Ukraine, including the position of the Ministry of Defense being uh, taken by people who had who were Russian nationals and had Russian passports. So that is the reason why in 2013, when Maidan won and Yanukovych with his team fled the country, the country was in such a bad situation. I mean, they, we literally did not have any money on the, on the single treasury account. Mm -hmm. And our army was nowhere to be found. I mean, in 2014, it was the volunteers who actually drafted and all Ukraine and all of our partners were helping us to rebuild the army from scratch. Because before that, by Russian nationals, probably deliberately, uh, everything was done. So it's not, it's not a new idea to install uh, either Russian supported or Russian led or even pure Russian uh, nationals and citizens on key positions in Ukraine. Now, I don't believe something like this is possible now. Because again, not only that we have the army and veterans and we have so many families that unfortunately are touched by the war. I mean, when you have over 14,000 dead, like we have since 2014 in this uh, war, it's literally any family or each family that has either a close relative or distant relative or somebody they know who either died or was wounded in this war. But on top of that, we have a vibrant civil society, something that differentiates us from Russia. So we have young and not so young people who will not be silent, who will be vocal, who will stand for their rights. And in addition to vibrant civil society, one of the key reforms that we have implemented in 2016 um, was the reform of decentralization. So in Ukraine, 
uh, we've done a revolutionary change. It's even revolutionary comparing to uh, some of the American states that not only we have given the land tax and uh, real estate tax to our local communities as their taxes to administer and collect, but we have given them part of the corporate income tax and personal income tax. So now since 2016, we have this really capable local communities and governments who have increased budgets now. They are more accountable for their population because you know where your mayor is, you know where your city council is, you know where your all your local authorities are. They have now the resources, the budgetary resources, and they have the possibility to improve people's lives. So I think, you know, we saw already in 2014 when it was, and 15, when it was relatively easy or it seemed easy for uh, Moscow to grab Crimea, but then when they started the offensive in, this, in the uh, Eastern Ukraine, they couldn't go and uh, do the same in Kharkiv or in Sumy or in Dnipropetrovsk, now Dnipro, or in other places. Because not only the people from Kiev went to help, uh, but the local community has been very vocal about it. The local law enforcement, the local people who got together and, and said, no, you know, we will not allow any aggressors to come and grab our cities. So, so again, I think, you know, all these factors and the fact that, you know, since 2014, we live with this reality is will make it very difficult or I would even say impossible to have any puppet government. Now, we are a democracy. And I think while we Ukrainians have to learn how to build institutions, that's a new skill for us because we never had our own institutions. It was always something foreign, but freedom is our religion. You know, to the point sometimes of anarchy, we're like very freedom loving. So. So I don't think any, you know, even people we who we elect, we help them, we hold them an, accountable. We criticize them. I know I was the minister of finance. And even though I was the new minister of finance, I came to the minister of finance uh, after the revolution of dignity from private sector. And even my own fellow civil society uh, members started checking and criticizing me the next day after I, I became a civil servant, which is, again, something very difficult to understand in Russia, yeah. but it's very natural in Ukraine. So I believe this democracy that regardless, you know, we have elections, we already have, uh, you know, the president who's the sixth president, and regardless of who, who is running, our elections are always free and fair. And they're very democratic, and there is always a change of power. And this is what people support. So I think, you know, to think that you can put some puppet government, I mean, I we believe the intelligence that there might be ideas like this, but I don't think it's a very realistic idea for Ukraine. The US has been criticized for turning away when uh, Putin uh, invaded Georgia and Crimea. And Putin is testing the West now to see. Um, he sees uh, perhaps an erosion of democracy, perhaps uh, uh, a lack of unity, bickering among allies about uh, that unity. And so he's gonna test that. What would you like to see the United States along with NATO and our European allies do now to demonstrate willingness, readiness, and military capability to repel the Russian incursion before it might occur. Beyond just the threat, what do you want Europe and the allies and NATO to do now? To let you to know we're serious. We're not turning away. Not this time. Thank you. Well, we actually are very grateful to, the, to, to, to what the US is doing now. And of course, you know, there is always uh, to say what can be done more. And I will, I will uh, go more in on detail on that. But I think the, su the support that we see now is unprecedented. I wish we had a support like that in 2014 
when the when the first attack happened. And I know that then, you know, the collective West, so to say, did not know what to make out of it. Nobody could have believed at the beginning that in 21st century, a country can invade a sovereign country and, and do it in such a, you know, direct and, and military way. But right now what we see among our friends that there is a clear understanding of the situation and there is a, a clear view of what can we do together in order to stop Russia and make them correct this behavior. Now, what we are focusing on uh, together with the United States mostly, with other allies as well, but since I'm the ambassador to the US, this is my job to work with my colleagues uh, here, is actually focusing on three levels or three layers of uh, deterrence. First, it's the political layer. So it's all the messaging, and there we see the increased messaging from all of our partners, and especially from the US, on the fact that they will never recognize the annexation of Crimea. They will never recognize you know, Russia's claims on Donetsk and Lugansk territory. They will stand firmly. And we really appreciate this ironclad support of our independence, territorial integrity. So all the political messages are there. And even when Russia, in all these attempts to have the dialogues, presents some, I would call them unbelievable uh, condition, you know, conditionalities like for NATO to promise not to take Ukraine or something else, we also hear very clear messages from, from the US that first, it is going to be up to Ukraine and NATO and up to Ukraine and the US to decide on our, what do we want to do there? Second, nothing will be decided about Ukraine without Ukraine. And that is a golden rule that for years Ukraine has been advocating for, and now we hear it back from our, from, from our colleagues and friends here. So the messaging is there. Now, the second layer is sanctions, economic layer. There should be heavy price to the country that is doing this to another country. And again, Russia is doing it not only to us. Look at Moldova and Transnistria, something that was done early in 90s. Look at Georgia, which has been attacked in 2008, and Ukraine that has been attacked in 2014. And I'm not even mentioning here the MH17. I'm not even mentioning the poisoning in, on the streets of London and many, many, many things where Russia is involved and is responsible for. So, you know, the, the sanctions that we have right now, and this is where we keep working with our colleagues and advocating, that sanctions should be stronger and they should increase. I really like the analogy that Ambassador McFall used in one of his articles, that if you park your car in a wrong place, you get a ticket, but if the car is there the next day, nobody is telling you, oh, we already ticketed you for that, you know? Mm -hmm. You get another ticket and another ticket until you take your car away. So uh, this, this is a perfect logic to be used for Russia. So until they leave, the occupied Crimea, illegally occupied, and until they leave Donetsk and Lugansk and change their aggressive behavior, the sanctions should be increasing. So that is related to economic sanctions, the Nord Stream 2 sanctions, because again, this is not an economic or energy pipeline. It's an energy weapon against Ukraine and against Europe. So this is where we have very open and honest discussions with our colleagues. We, of course, welcome all the sanctions that we're discussing right now. We, of course, welcome the new uh, draft legislation pieces by many senators and congressmen, namely, you know, Senator Menendez and others, you know, some of them are bipartisan, some of them not, but we support all of them, all sanctions. The more sanctions we can have in order to push Russia to change their behavior, the better. And of course the sanction can be taken away when they do so. And the third level is the defense layer of deterrence. So building, helping us to build our defense capabilities. And this is also where we see a lot of progress. So while, you know, in 2014, 2015, if you go back to the press of that time, there was a discussion 
that we wanted a lethal defense capabilities and nobody was going to give it to us. Thanks God, it's not the case anymore. We are getting the lethal defense capabilities from the United States. Right now on a daily basis, we have the planes coming in, delivering the uh, weapons that were authorized by President Biden in December, the 200 million US dollars. We also have the help from Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. And also we here need to thank the United States because they very quickly authorized them to provide us with some of the equipment which has US technologies. Now, we are peaceful, we are a peaceful country. We are not, we never attacked anyone and we are never going to attack anyone. We even do not plan any offensives on the territories that belong to us and temporarily occupied. But we believe that if we have these defense capabilities, when our army on a daily basis is becoming more and more compliant with NATO standards and uh, becoming more capable, that increases the cost, the potential cost for invasion if Russia decides to do so. And we believe that they also looking at how we are improving our defense capabilities will take this into account. So what can we do more? Do more of all of that. <laughs> Do continue with the political strong messages, continue with economic sanctions, and this way, you know, the more the better. Continue with building the defense capabilities and very important NATO. I know it's a difficult discussion because it, it's not a one country decision. It requires all 30 members of the alliance to take, uh, you know, to take decision together. But Ukraine in NATO is something that will firmly put us in the mind of the Russian leadership into the other country basket. That we have crossed the bridge, that we are now part of the West. And not only that we would like to have to be part of NATO as kind of future security guarantee, but also we have a lot to add to NATO. As the NATO Extended Opportunity Partner, we have the EOP status since 2020 already, Ukraine is adding a lot to the NATO operations. And we believe that our, again, battle-tested army can be useful for uh, the allies in the NATO for joint exercises and deterrence in other places of the world. Um, let's shift a little bit to media. Um, I'd like to ask a question here. Uh, Russia is very effective with their, with their information campaigns or misinformation campaigns. And media is very, very effective. Um, and what methods are Putin's Russia using to erode support by Ukrainians to their government? How is the Ukrainian government able to defuse the attempts by Putin to misinform Ukrainians and keep them aligned in support of a fully sovereign and free Ukraine, because we are listening here to the media. Uh, we're very curious, what is the average Ukrainian doing on the streets of Kyiv, as well as in the rural areas, in all sectors? And are they, are they responding with concern, with fear? Are they, uh, particularly as they watch um, diplomatic embassies take their own families home? So what, how, what is the effect of Putin's own media campaign uh, on, on what they're doing. How is that impeding uh, this process? Thank you. It's a very, very important question because while, you know, the military aggression, we all are looking at the, you know, this equipment around the border. We all are trying to guess whether, you know, it's, it's a show or it's a real threat, when it's, when it's going to happen, whether it's going to happen. We know it happened before, so we cannot discount it, of course. But all these hybrid aggression techniques and media is one of the most widespread and it never stopped since 2014. It actually started even earlier. It's something that is very difficult to deal with because first Ukraine is a democratic country and we do value freedom of press. Mm -hmm. So it means that everyone almost can say what they want and how they want it. Now, of course, that was used and misused during all 30 years when a number of 
Ukrainian channels, TV channels, for example, or newspapers or media outlets were either owned by Russians directly or by government-related Russian uh, individuals or by oligarchs. And that's another, you know, uh, big issue that we have in Ukraine when we have started fighting with corruption, but it's not only, you know, this pure corruption like briberies or something like this, it's also the capture of the state, something that not a lot of countries have uh, deal with, especially in the US or Western world, when you have quite a few individuals or large uh, corporations which are so related their business models to the using and misusing of the budget uh, resources and budget money and participating in procurement or privatization before without any competition. So, and it's very much related also with the uh, narratives in the press. So Russia has been spending a lot of resources on this media campaigns and it's everything from false information, misinformation, deliberate disinformation, I mean, all of the above. We have a couple of grassroots initiatives together with the Ministry of Informational Policy in Ukraine, which were called Stop Fake and others, they're still very active, where we are trying to correct the narrative. And we have to do it not only in Ukraine, but also outside. Just recently, I had to send uh, quick emails and letters to some of the media outlets here Mm -hmm. who put Kharkiv, comma, Russia, but Kharkiv is our city. Or to all the media outlets that uh, put the maps of Ukraine and put Crimea as a Russian territory. And we say, no, 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 you know, here is the information. Mm -hmm. Or something like this. But this all does not happen just by mistake. We know that, you know, Russian propaganda machine is working, working very actively with the media outlets, with the social media especially, trying to disseminate this information, push this information and you know, convince people otherwise. So we are trying at the state level to provide, to be open, to provide as much information and to correct these fakes. We are trying to work with our friends and allies. We are cooperating with, uh, uh, now we are sharing a lot of information. So it's where the informational policy actually together with the cybersecurity, because a lot of this information or disinformation attacks also happen related with the cyber attacks. So we are uh, sharing it. We are participating in many joint projects. We are asking the help from our American friends, but also other European to work together with us on countering it, because again, if you look at this information slash cyber attacks, everything that you experience in the United States, especially during the last couple of years, it's everything that was tested on us. So we had the attacks on our critical infrastructure and banking system in 2016. We had attack on our governmental resources all, all the time. We had this information, this information campaigns prior to the elections where the whole both armies have been organized and you know directed in order to influence people's uh, opinion to, to especially we see it now with the many uh, campaigns which seem to be not related with the political events like anti-vaccination or something like this but ultimately it's it's the networks that they're trying to create in the social media and then activate them when they need them for the political for some political issues so it's very difficult, I have to be honest with you. I don't think we are in, alone there. I think, you know, the social media uh, as an instrument is mm -hmm. still something very new to all of us, not only to Ukraine, but to Western Europe, Eastern Europe, United States. I think we still are looking for ways how to deal with it properly, because again, it, 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 there is a growing generation of young people who have access to social media and have access to devices and access to information even with before they deliver the uh, develop the critical thinking uh, later on or during the so it, it's a whole new uh, you know set of problems even when you are not 
Ukraine attacked by Russia deliberately, even in countries that uh, live in peace, prosperous, and everything is fine with them, nobody is threatening them. Even in those countries, the social media and access to information and the new ways how people communicate and how people disseminate information is a challenge. How do you do the fact checks? How do you, uh, you know, make sure that young people differentiate the good uh, scientific program from some fake, you know, um, program made by a popular blogger? It's the both. Right. So, but it's all multiplied in Ukraine because we do have Russia that is working very actively to use all of these possibilities in order to, 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 um, uh, you know, disseminate the, the false information. Now, you asked me, how do people react to this? Mm -hmm. So again, we are trying, we see that on majority of issues, like right now, you can even in Facebook see how almost all Ukrainians put the Ukrainian flag on, on their avatars. And it's amazing how people of different professions, different walk of life are very united in this. So I think, you know, people are talking to each other, people are talking to their communities. There is a common sense in so many things. And even with this attack, people are not panicking. I mean, of course, people are very concerned. Of course, people consuming all this information and seeing all the threats, it affects people. But Ukrainians are content, ready to defend the country. And even when we are concerned, unfortunately, you know, we live with this war for the past eight years. It's a war, it's, it's, it's a horrible thing to say, you know, because it's not something that you should be, you know, okay to live with in the normal world. But we are coping. Yes, I would like to, you came to the United States as a young woman. And Ukraine's youth has, have grown up not living under a Soviet Union thumb, but with much of the, uh, the, civil, the civil society that you have described. Um, they have read a, a press, they read, they've heard disagreement in the press, they've uh, been able to, to speak freely, uh, they've traveled into Europe, of course, and many like you have traveled to the United States through a whole myriad of student exchanges and groups. Um, and, and of course, you mentioned social media, which many youth rely on that for their news source. With Ukrainians' youth, what what do they? How do they see their future? And would there be a concern within Ukraine that if Putin is successful with his aggression, that you may lose some of the youth because they don't want to live under that regime? They want to live under the freedoms that they have now within the civil society. So how, what is, how is the Ukraine, the youth, they see their future? Either way, how do they see their future and how are they reacting to this? Thank you. Well, uh, they will not leave because Putin will not succeed. Okay. And yes, they do not want to leave. They will not want to leave in a country without freedom, mm -hmm. but they will fight for this, not only leave because of this and I'm, I'm positive you know so uh, you're absolutely right I always joke that I'm the last generation that was born in Soviet Union you know my children even the older ones they have no idea that there, there could be a reality where Ukraine is not a sovereign country mm -hmm. I almost I graduated from high school in Soviet Union I mean just when Ukraine gained the independence but the majority of my school were in the Soviet school but young people during this last 30 years, we already have a full generation of people who love Ukraine, who value what we have in Ukraine, and they really like to live and work in Ukraine. We have quite a number of them who traveled, who got their degrees outside. I was very fortunate to have, to, to have been selected as the Muskie Fellow to go to Indiana University. Uh, some people would go through different programs but actually we're trying and it's one of my goals as an ambassador in the cultural diplomacy and educational diplomacy to increase these travels for young people both Americans American school uh, children going to Ukraine for the on the exchange programs and Ukrainians going here and I think that will have 
a larger and more, more stronger impact on how they will feel themselves and how they will develop as three individuals that are that know the world, that value uh, other countries, but also love their own. So we, of course, I mean, some people will go and travel and will stay where they travel. Some people will have families in other countries. I mean, it's natural. I, I don't think we should prohibit people to, to immigrate. But what we see now, and I see it increasingly, that people go get education abroad, give, have some experience abroad, and they come back and they give back to their countries. So I believe, you know, we have to focus more on these exchanges. And I see among young people, because young people have been the driving force of the Orange Revolution in 2004, and also the Revolution of Dignity in 2013. Unfortunately, you know, the heavenly hundred, as we call them, people who were killed during the revolution on Maidan by, uh, again, the uh, Yanukovych's militia, uh, during the peaceful protests, the majority of them are very young, you know, but even in their mind, they were ready to defend the country and they were ready to fight for freedom. I think it's our uh, job is actually to do everything possible. That's why diplomats are working on the diplomatic solution so that we can preserve all of this talent that we have. And uh, just recently, uh, there was an interesting video from the front line uh, and there were just, uh, you know, interviews with the soldiers and they were asking them, who are you? What do you do in the peaceful life? And they were IT, IT specialists, farmers, you know, everyone else. And they were asking one of the farmers, so what is it that you dream of? And he's like, oh, I dream to plant trees, you know, and everything else. But this is where I have to be now to defend my country. But my God, I'm like dreaming and sleeping and dreaming about the day when I can go back to my potatoes and tomatoes. Yes. So this is what we want the young people to do, whatever really is inspiring them. Uh, before you have to leave, because we know you have to leave close to the top of the hour and you've got another engagement at eight o'clock. Uh, going back to Europe, um, and you've mentioned several times what you would like to see Europe, your, your European friends, uh, clearly the US and NATO do. But is there a concern within Ukraine? You know, Putin times things carefully. He's about calculating and he's doing this in a very cold winter. And with much of Europe largely dependent on Russia for its energy, is there a concern with Ukraine, as we're seeing in Germany, that there may not be the force um, that Ukraine is going to need if Putin really pushes uh, and enters and, and does even an, an invasion over, let alone marching toward Kiev, just simply entering. Is there a concern? Well, everywhere where we see concern, we see that we just need to work a little bit harder there. So uh, the strategy of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs is not only working with the European Union and individual countries, but we're using a number of new formats how to generate support for Ukraine and how to work together for better and secure Europe. So we have created during the past year, we have created the Lublin Triangle. It's the kind of union uh, of Ukraine, Poland and Lithuania. Historical uh, ties uh, between our countries are very strong and we're discussing a lot of issues between the three of us. Uh, then we have the associated trio which is Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. And there are a lot of issues that we're discussing in that uh, way. Of course, I mean, we have the Normandy format for the peace talks, and that's where we are together with Russia and uh, French and Germany. Mm -hmm. And we do understand that on all these difficult issues, either bilateral or in this uh, uh, collective formats, that each country is thinking first and foremost about their own interests and about the uh, struggles that their business might have from the sanctions, for example, or they have to think about how vulnerable they will be during the winter period, as you rightfully said, because some of them still are very dependent on Russian gas, for example. But what we are trying to convince them, and I think it's becoming clear to everyone that it's not only Ukraine 
that Putin wants. It's in general a disruption and his way of talking about the spheres of interest, mm -hmm. which you know should not even be something that countries discuss in the 21st century. And more and more countries already see that if they are dependent on either gas resources or others, it's becoming their vulnerability. So yes, they might live through this heating season, but what about the next one? What conditionalities will Russia put on the table? So we see more and more countries diversifying. We see more and more countries uh, putting the energy sustainability or efficiency or independence as their goal. And we have even, it's a very difficult and slow process, but we have more and more countries understanding that it's very difficult to have a secure and peaceful Europe without a secure and peaceful Ukraine. We are not a problem for European security. We are a solution. The stable and free Ukraine is, is the solution and key to uh, the, the stability in Europe, but also in the wider Black Sea region. So again, I wouldn't, you know, I, I cannot say that everything is rosy and everyone is supporting us because if it would be so, then we would be in NATO and European Union already. It's a long process. And there is a fair share of reforms that we ourselves have to do in order to uh, be on that road. But as we have shown in the visa-free regime track, where we have complied and we did all the reforms, and honestly, during the past eight years, Ukraine has done more reforms than Ukraine ever did during the previous 20 years, but also more than any Eastern European country or even Western European country did in such a short period of time while being attacked by other military power, much stronger one. So um, with some European countries, we are much closer and we see eye to eye. With some, we are at the, you know, in the middle of the process or beginning of the process of actually getting closer. But we believe that we all share the same values. That's why we have signed the association agreement with European Union. That's why we are strategic partners with the United States. That's why we are partners with the United Kingdom, with Canada, because all this democratic civilized world is much closer to us and we are much closer to them than to anyone else. And uh, we believe that together we will be able to not only overcome this crisis that we have now, we will remain independent, we will restore our territorial integrity and remain sovereign, but also we can focus on the development. Again, this is, this is the dream, to have Ukraine realize our full potential. That's where we're still at the beginning of the curve. And we are close to the top of the hour, and I know you need to leave us, and I'm so sorry. Uh, there are so many more questions I wish we could ask you. Uh, my apologies to those people who said, but you did ask my question. <laughs> and so thank you very much. Uh, I think that just shows how much interest. I'm hoping that the questions um, and this interest, the number of people who came this evening, show you, demonstrate for you that we do care. We are paying attention. Uh, Indiana is watching, the world is watching, we, we care very a, a great deal. And we, again, are so thankful for the time that you gave us this evening in the middle of what is a very tense and serious time for Ukraine. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I would like to thank you for organizing it. It was, it was such a pleasure, Betty, and uh, I look forward actually to being physically in Indiana. So we can do it once again, but sitting in the same place. And I would like to thank everyone. Thank you for taking the time this evening and spending it discussing and getting to know something about Ukraine. And uh, we really value and appreciate it. So thank you very much. And I hope tomorrow is will be yet another peaceful day for all of us. I do too. We all do. Thank you very, very much. I look forward to meeting you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.